so um, today's lecture uh, represents um, an unusual one from several perspectives. The first is, you know, that I'm delivering it here uh, while ill remotely, and I regret that and appreciate your accommodation. The second aspect is that um, uh, it represents in some ways uh, itself a transition, in some ways the sort of transom to a transition um, for next time. Um, I, I, I speak of that because today's lecture um, uh, addresses some things that have um, uh, mathematical and uh, substantive uh, significance, but also weave in um, some uh, pragmatics uh, associated with uh, application of these methods. And uh, next time, I'm, I'm hoping on Thursday, two days from now, um, that um, we might be able to uh, to pass the baton uh, to Xiaoyan um, for uh, bringing us into uh, the beginning of a sustained module on stock and flow.jl and um, uh, pursuit of system dynamics modeling uh, for uh, more full fledged uh, causal loop diagrams, system structure diagrams, and stock flow diagrams. Um, that will really uh, occupy us for the second, third of this course. Um, but I'm I'm really glad to be talking about the materials for today because they, in some ways, they lay the groundwork for for uh, this next um, this next module on on stock flow and indeed on on algebraic ABMs. Uh, the subsequent model be, uh, module beyond that. Um, but they also uh, flesh out a component of uh, actual applied use of these methods that has kind of been in the background. And it's been um, uh, something that Xiaoyan and I have wanted to deal with um, for some time. And today is the day we're going to take it on. Um, and it has great uh, practical significance as well as some um, intriguing mathematical significance that will be left, uh, whose explication will be left for a later session. So I am just now going to shift to some slides. Uh, and we'll be having some significant um, uh, exploration as well with um, with interactive components after I go through some basics. Um, so thus far in the course, we've uh, made much of the use of C sets, these copresheaves. Uh, these mappings from schema categories to set as a foundational tool uh, within our work. And uh, folks will um, remember we've covered this for many particular categories, right? Like for graphs, um, we had a schema category of graphs and by mapping them to set, the schema category to set with a structure preserving mapping of functor, uh, we could capture uh, particular graphs. Each such graph was associated with a different such functor. And of course, we pursued this for a variety of other categories, for discrete dynamical systems, uh, and indeed for causal loop diagrams in, in a sort of very primitive way, uh, and indeed for an agent-like uh, schema. And uh, when applying ourselves um, to this enterprise, uh, we uh, took uh, great advantage, um, secured great benefit from, and took great delight, if I might say so myself, um, in Eugenia Cheng's um, uh, guidance to us that 
much of category theory is 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 focused uh, on taking relationships seriously. Um, so we had relationships captured within a given schema category, and they turned into relationships between the sets uh, formed by functions. Um, uh, we had uh, at a higher level, these functors, they gave relationships from this category to this other, right? Mapping objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms in a way that preserves structure. We had natural transformations in a way that mapped in a structure preserving fashion uh, from one of these, um, these functors encoding one diagram to one encoding, say, a different diagram. And uh, the fact that this preserved structure meant that there was a homomorphism uh, between the associated objects, be they graphs, be they discrete dynamical, particular di discrete dynamical systems, be they um, uh, causal loop diagrams, et cetera, right? Um, so we had these homomorphisms. And this narrative, if you think about it, was all about the relationships involved. Right. Um, uh, whether it was within a category, between categories, or between functors, whether it was in the form of homomorphisms of graphs or homomorphisms of of uh, discrete dynamical systems, homomorphisms of that agent-like schema, um, we had relationships captured between quantities, and I argued. Uh, in our last class, that it was this ability to capture relationships, to reason with mathematical rigor about them, that in many ways gave these methods this power to treat graphs not as one-off entities or discrete dynamical systems, not as solitudes, um, but rather to relate them to one another. And to do so with uh, not only rich mathematics, but mathematics that was uh, reproducible and, and uh, generalized from one context to another, to another, to another. We chose four, right? Discrete dynamical systems, graphs, this agent-based schema, and this uh, causal loop diagram, primitive causal loop diagram schema. But the story there was powerful precisely in part in large part because not only its richness but its generality and it can be applied to an unlimited number of other contexts and indeed um uh this method provides us with this extremely rich way of encoding the structures of different domains and the relationships between them but it was relationships through and through all all throughout there um Right. Um, and we took advantage of those relationships in many different ways, at many different levels of abstraction. We used them to reason about, you know, universal constructions and categorical algebras to build products and co-products and pushouts and pullbacks and and uh, terminal objects and initial objects within categories, one category after another. But it was all about the relationships, right? Um, and uh, that provided us um, great, great opportunities. Uh, but it turns out that, you know, if one's to think about the realities of, of data in the world, while relational data of this form while relations between factors in the world um, are indeed a central and arguably uh, a defining component of certain spheres, while representing them at a rich level gives us enormous benefit. It's not the only uh, type of data that are out there. Uh, with combinatorial data, and I'm going to juxtapose, or I'm going to contrapose this, um, contrast this with with uh, another type of data I'll call attribute data. With combinatorial data, you may remember that we had data captured 
in the form of almost tables in a database. I, I think you'll remember this, right? Um, if if we were to go and and why am I not being able to drag this? Uh, I see it's because I'm displaying this in in uh, this mode. So I'll I'll just go here. But if we were to look at um, some of our examples here, we might have a schema, right? Um, and the schema relates the characterizes through relationships between a person uh, and their age group, person and province, a dog and the caregiver, that's a person. Um, and we have these relationship names shown here. And we could build up a, a little database of sorts with it, right? Where we have, for example, dogs, one, two, three, four, five, and persons, one through 20. And we could indicate for each dog who its caregiver is. Now, in this case, you'll notice that um, we have these tables of primary keys. And when we have a another column here, like this caregiver column in the dog table, what we have here are, are foreign keys, right? This 15 is referring to the caregiver of a dog as a person. So it's referring to person number 15 and we could look up you know who that person is here and we could say okay this is a person who's in age group one and province two here um uh or uh alternatively if we considered you know person we could look up you know which specific uh province number they were associated with uh, but these these numbers here are always foreign keys into some particular table, right? And the ordering, I think you'd agree, was somewhat immaterial between persons and dogs. As long as we captured that relationship between them, um, the person we call person one is not particularly distinguished here, right? Um, we could have called them person 20 or person 15, but what we would have had to preserve was the relationship uh, between that person and age groups and between that person and provinces, between dogs and that person. The exact number we gave to you know the dogs was equally immaterial. Um, we could have just as easily called dog three, dog five, or dog one, as long as we were consistent in saying the um, appropriate number for its caregiver. Right. Um, and indeed, when we when we searched for things like when we searched here for people from who are of the same age and same province, right? Um, uh, we made use of a query that said, "Okay, find me two people who between them had the same have the same age in the same province," but we. We didn't get into what province that was, what particular dog or what particular age group that was. Uh, similarly, with people um, who were, uh, excuse me, people who both uh, had dogs and were from the same province, right? Um, uh, so here they were from the same province. Uh, each person had a dog. Um, they could be, you know, in general, they have two different age groups. Um, the relationships were such that we were looking for a common province, um, uh, but we weren't going to insist on a common age group or a common dog um, or, or a dog um, uh, that had the same person in common as its caregiver. Um, and almost the way in which we phrase these these patterns that gave rise to our queries, so homomorphism finding, you know, pointed to the fact we were looking for recurrent relationships. We weren't focused in on finding a particular person, just two people who met this pattern, right? Two dogs, whatever their name. We could have rearranged this whole table in the population as long as we were consistent about keeping track of the relationships involved, you know, which 
um, which person uh, was the caregiver for which dog, we could shift those, those um, the orderings around without problems. We we're dealing with relationships, not the specifics, the intrinsic value, you know, of the provinces involved or the age groups involved or the people involved the designation of the people or the dogs. We were looking how they were related to one another. Um, and that was kind of uh, implicit in all our treatment, whether it was graphs and edge with vertices and edges, or whether it was discrete dynamical systems. It, it was immaterial how we numbered the vertices or the edges, as long as the relationship between them were consistent. It was immaterial how we numbered the states of the discrete dynamical system, what mattered is their relationship to one another, what followed what, right? I think I think this general um, notion should be a familiar one, um, but in short, we're dealing with relational data. It was only really defined up to, to isomorphism. Um, it wasn't defined uh, in a way that, that hinged on the particular number involved associated with the province for a person or associated with the person um, person's ID associated with the dog. And we saw the category theory is this exquisitely expressive, general, powerful language for describing and reasoning about and analyzing these relationships and finding their implication. We could do astounding things with it. We could as I indicated, do logic with it. You know, we could find the terminal and initial objects. We could reason about products and co-products. We could glue things together. All these amazing things in domain after, or sort of area of application of it after area of application. But we're all using relational data. Data in the world uh, has a lot of relational data. And we certainly want to, you know, exert our the power of category theory over this data. Uh, we wanna use that power. But there's another type of data. And it's a type of data that everyone here, without exception, with which you are familiar. And it's what I will call, for lack of a better term, attribute data, okay? Um, it's data that, where we do actually care about um, the intrinsic uh, values of things where, you know, a hemoglobin A1C value or a score on the, on a depression uh, inventory or a, uh, uh, an indicator of someone's uh, province name matters uh, for uh, our concerns. A datum here it's not just an arbitrary designation, an index, as it were, into a table that can be rearranged as long as we are consistent in, in um, uh, keeping the relationships. No, I mean, the, the values are not interchangeable. You know, age group 80 plus is not the same as age group 20 to 25, as you'll learn. Um, uh, here... The data, the numbers, are not just foreign keys into some table. They have some in intrinsic meaning. And, you know, Eugenia Chang beckoned us into category theory um, with, you know, the encouragement that we can get great power out of looking at the role that things play in different contexts, focusing on those relationships. Um, but... There certainly are times where at a pragmatic level, we very much care about the value associated with um, uh, a, a, a quantity in our in our data, right? Values are, where values are not interchangeable, um, where particular values can have particular significance, where we're concerned if someone has diabetes by looking at their you know, uh, uh, their fasting gl blood glucose uh, measurement or their oral glucose tolerance test score or or uh, as a, a screening indicator, their HbA1c, um, 
high value is different from a low value. Particular values can have special significance here by the roles they play. And in a paper whose link I posted, a powerful paper whose link I posted to um, to the Canvas site, um, a paper by Evan Patterson, uh, by Owen Lynch and James Fairbanks, um, categorical data structures um, for or data structures for categorical computing. Um, they make some insightful comments on on relational and non-relational data. And they note that the familiar construct that many of us, I think perhaps all of us have worked with here um, in tools like Python or R um, in tools like MATLAB, uh, where we have data frames um, that capture successive columns of data Typically, we're dealing with in those data frames attribute data, um, data on the intrinsic characteristic of things. So you, you can try to shoehorn relational data into there, but you do so in kind of an ad hoc, somewhat error prone way where you have to do a lot of work. Not, not in the sort of way we do with, with uh, Cat Lab and Algebraic Julia, where it's designed to shine with relational data but where we can write code to kind of map one thing, one table to another. But it's not very good at, at dealing with these relational quantities, what I'll call combinatorial data, or that's the term that, that um, Topos tends to use for it. By contrast, relational databases, almost by their very name, they shout out the fact that they capture relational as well as attribute data. Um, uh, many of you are aware we have principles like normalization of the, of data where we break things up into different tables and we use foreign keys from one table to another. But we also have plenty of data typically that's attribute data, right? Um, um, C sets, as we've been seeing them thus far, and as they're defined, really deal with relational data. They deal with these cases where values are only defined up to isomorphism, where it doesn't matter whether we rearrange, you know, dog one and dog five, as long as the relationships with the caregivers for those dogs are, are maintained. Um, so, you know, if we think about realistic contexts, um, uh, we start to think about the motivation for moving beyond C sets, these mappings from a schema category into set, where we have just a simple schema category and we map it over here into a to a codomain of 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 set or fin set. But we start to deal with attributed data, a C set data. Okay. Um and you know, if you think about a context uh, to which we've appealed before at some level, where we might have veterans and dogs, but maybe the veterans carry smartphones and the dogs carry beacons. You know, there's a certain amount of relational data here, right? Which dog is associated with which veteran and which dog has which beacon, right? What are the beacons associated with the dog dogs? Or which veteran carries which smartphone and you know it's associated with what dog the other part of that that other relation but but then there's going to be lots of extra information we realistically we want to capture right veterans names dogs names especially subi um smartphone ids beacon ids um maybe veterans hpa a1c levels or levels on a depression inventory um, the specific province or territory associated with a veteran. We, we care. We don't just want to have interchangeable numbers for provinces where we don't know what's province 10 and what's one because, it you know, there's it's just a matter of the relationships. No, we might care that this province, that this veteran is in a certain province for a certain reason. Um, 
and age groups. Um, we might recognize there are certain vulnerabilities associated with elder veterans that are not going to be there with one in their 30s, for example. So, you know, I hope crude as it is that this, you know, vignette gives you, you know, brings you face to face with the fact that in real world circumstances, while we have massive amounts of the sort of data where CSETs excel, this relational data, reasoning about it, we often have large amounts of data in which we are interested, which does have intrinsic values of intrinsic significance, which has, to, to quote uh, that article I had mentioned, the aforementioned article, fixed external meaning associated with them, and where, you know, um, we can't just shuffle things in, according to some isomorphism and and get equal insights. The youngest age group is not the same as the oldest age group, et cetera. So we're going to be transitioning at a pragmatic level today from C sets to a, these A C sets or actions as they're they're called by Topos. Uh, and there's going to be some sort of math debt or theoretical debt we're going to build up that we're going to carry for a bit of time in this course until we can discharge it. I've been telling a very nice story about C sets, right? We have these schemas that are presentations of categories. You may remember it for a graph schema. Um, it's finitely presented. We can draw it out with a fixed number of objects and morphisms, even though the implication of it through composition is such that there may be an infinite number of morphisms if you consider the composition. We call this, you know, it's it's finitely freely presented in a finite way. Um, we know that next, next is there, and next, 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 and next, 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 next. Um, but we present it in this fashion, uh, recognizing that without equations, this indicates that um, this is a free, uh, a free category uh, where each of those paths through will be different. So um, here we're going to be moving on from the C sets where the schema is a presentation of a category to these attributes, these attributed C sets, where a schema is actually not a presentation of a category, it's actually a presentation of a profunctor. And Cheyenne and I talked about it, we decided that rather than going into a multi-lecture coverage of profunctors, just to give you the mathematical scoop on what's going on with attributed C sets. We would defer that. And for now, we're just going to um, appeal to intuition. We're going to wave our hands a bit. Um, you're going to find that attributed C sets are pretty familiar constructs, pretty understandable constructs. You can develop good intuitions without knowing all the details of the map. There's a beautiful math story there. It's a it's 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 quite quite pretty. It's um uh it's one that uh can teach um good understanding of other things like about profunctors. But I want to get further in the class before we take the time for that. I really wanna to enter into practical use of, of uh for stockflow.jl um, uh, quickly here. So today we're going to be going on from CSETs to attributes, and I'm going to introduce you some to attributes, okay? Um, and, and try to talk about cases where we might make use of attributed data for a variety of, of small operational vignettes. Now, uh, I stand uh, 
I stand corrected. I stand to be corrected here because I need to post, and and I have, I have uh, made a boo boo by not posting here to the Canvas site uh, the appropriate the appropriate files here. So uh, I am going to to go and oh, we're on the wrong class. <laughs> okay. That 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 makes sense. Um, and we'll go and post them to the eight fifty six. So I'm going to upload uh, two two files um, for downloading by you here, uh, and I am hoping that you could grab them. I would also note that uh, I have. Uh, posted a announcement to the course site about getting the new Docker image. And if you haven't done that, I'll provide a few words on that right now. Um, and uh, maybe anyone who hasn't yet had a chance to, to do that can go get it. So if you call up Docker Desktop, um, and you go to your images area, uh, you'll see a variety of these images that Eric has made available. The, the one at issue we're gonna be using today is this one algebraic rewriting, okay? And uh, what we're going to be doing here is using this, these three dots and doing pull. And it will take a bit of time until it pulls down. Um, you'll then want to run that uh, Docker image. And you'll in that process, you'll want to remember that you need to tell it um, to run on a certain port, right? Um, and all of this is described in this in Docker instructions for obtaining algebraic Julia, stock float or jail in the algebraic ABM's Docker containers, okay? Um, but basically when you go to run it, uh, you would be presented with a dropdown and you would uh, indicate the port number, say 8888, with which you wish to run it uh, here and you could do run and start it up. So in order to make use of these examples that I just posted to Canvas, you're going to want to download. You're going to want to have that new version of the Docker image because it does depend. The correct operation of these examples do depend on having an updated version of algebraic rewriting. Shagyam, do you want to say anything about that before I, I dive into the specifics? Uh, no, um, no. Um, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, and if anyone's viewing this remotely and wants to get them, I think you could do it uh, by going to Eric Redekop's um, uh, uh, collection on Docker Hub. Okay, um, so uh, I have already started my uh, Docker image and I would like to, um, to go into a motivating example that I just uploaded. Um, and it's this eight underbar labeled primitive causal loop diagram, okay? Now, um, it may have struck you as a little bit peculiar previously that we had causal loop diagrams built up um, with vertices, with plus and minus links, uh, etc. But the vertices were just anonymously labeled, or I shouldn't say anonymously, but they were interchangeably enabled. Vertex 1, vertex 2, vertex 3, vertex 4, etc. There was nothing that related them to any specific concept or variable factor like we would traditionally use in building up a causal loop diagram. They were abstract mathematical, math, mathematical entities, but they abstracted away at such a high level 
we simply call the vertices vertex one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, in a way that captured the relational structure. But you know, if they've been reordered, it, it wouldn't have made any difference because they had no particular significance of numbers. Here we're going to add in labels to them. So let's let's go from the start. We're gonna use cat lab here. Um and it's possible yours will, if you're using this for the first time with that Docker image, it's possible it will go and have to load in a lot of packages. Um, so uh, I'll try not to run away uh, ahead. And then I've defined a causal loop diagram schema. And I'm gonna try to grow this here so you can see it a little bit more easily. Um, Maybe it's just my being ill, but it's it's a bit tough for my eyes. Um, okay, so this schema may look vaguely similar um, and encouragingly so to what we've been dealing with all along. Um, after all, we have objects, we have these homes that specify for a, for example, for a plus, link, um, what are its source vertex, what's its target vertex, same thing here. But there's an important thing that's new, and that is the inclusion of this little bit of substance here. And that's what distinguishes this from being a presentation uh, of a category to a presentation actually of a profile. Okay, it, it's distinguishing this from being a C set schema to being an attributed C set schema or attribute schema. So I'm gonna press. Uh, I'm gonna gonna run this, and uh, it it does so. Um, and I'm going to draw it out, and then we'll talk about a little bit about how to interpret this. Okay. Um, so I'm plotting that's out with GraphBiz and. One thing you'll notice is this new thing is a label and it's shown with a different diagrammatic mechanism. It's shown as an attribute, okay? As, as being associated with an attribute type. And just like as if it were a an object, there, there can be morphisms to it. In this case, for a given vertex, there's something that maps from that vertex to this type of vertex labels um, that is called V label. So given a vertex, we can ask for its vertex label and get something of type V label. V label itself is an attribute type. It's not an object. It's not a table as it were. Um, I mean, it, crudely you, you could, you'll sometimes find David Spivak or saying, well, if you want, you could think of it as a table of strings. And and to a degree, that's true. But, um, uh, and he would know far better than I, but a key point here is that every vertex here um, is going to have a column, which actually embeds the string in it, not merely a pointer to this, or not merely a, a, prime, a foreign key into a, into some table called the label. No, no, no. There's not going to be a table, uh, you know, in practice called the label. Uh, rather, each vertex will have a column called the label that gives a string. So this is what this looks like when we have an attribute type and a morphism to the attribute type. And here's an attribute type associated with that, okay? Um, so this is something which maps from, this should really be a C set type of of uh, the CLD schema to set. This is should all be familiar, right? We add a schema and then we have to, to say how to map it to set. Before that was a simple, that was a simple functor mapping from a, from a uh, category uh, into a um, into a, uh, a category set or a pin set. Here, there's a profunctor involved. Now, 
importantly, this attribute type, we have to say what that attribute type is for a particular instance of this thing, a particular CSAT. We have to say what attribute type do we want? And that's what this next line is, okay? We're, we're saying we're going to call a, a CSAT of one of these with a string attribute, with a string as this attribute type for V label. For every attribute type, it, it needs a parameterized type. Uh, and so we give it, we tell it, use the string for that label type, okay? Um, so that's what this is. This is this. So we have this AC set type, set type, which doesn't yet commit to any particular type for this attribute, but it's when we map it or excuse me, when we parameterize it with a particular attribute type that we get something that we can then, for example, create. So this is our an instance with that's going to allow us to create these labeled causal loop diagrams. One of these will be a causal diagram which where each vertex has a label and you can see it here um so we have a we have two vertices there's a, a plus link and a minus link and the source of the plus link is one and the target of the plus link is two the source of the minus link is two and the and the target of the minus link is one and the vertex for vertex one has label hunger. Um, so that's vertex one. And vertex two has label food eat, eaten. So there's a plus link from hunger to food eaten. And there's a minus link from food in, uh, eaten back to hunger. Okay. So here we go. You'll notice. It's it's easy to miss, but you'll notice I said somewhat confusingly the V label here equals zero. And my way of thinking about it is that that means there's no attribute variables involved. And meaning and this would if this were one, there'd be one attribute variable. We'll learn about attribute variables. Um, in our next file. Shayan, do you have any comment on that? Uh, no. Okay. 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 So here's our database, as it were, that encodes our primitive causal loop diagram. This is the table for vertices. Each vertex has a set of primary keys. And then it has a label for each vertex, the hunger label. Notice that this is not a foreign key into some other table. Remember that? But before each table would have the primary key. And then if we add another column, it would be a foreign key into some other table, like into the dog table or into the province table or whatever. Here, we just did the value embedded in this table, hunger food eaten in this table okay um a plus here the the plus link goes from one to two hunger to food eaten for the plus link l minus goes from two to one food eaten to hunger okay um now we can seek to visualize this it's it's actually not going to be too exciting um to uh, to do that, uh, but we could we could seek to do it. Um, okay, so um, okay, uh, here we are. Um, you notice it doesn't know enough to print the names or anything. We would need to add some logic 
which can be done so that graph viz can visualize a causal loop diagram. That That is something which Shaoyan knows how to do, and we could we could talk to her about how to do it. But here we have two vertices. They are, in fact, labeled. We saw the labels just up above, um, but they that label does not appear in an obvious way within this link. We could then have a causal loop diagram B, an Atchet encoded causal loop diagram B, where we have the same vertex names, but we have some extra linkages between them. This is not based on some deep understanding of the physiology of eating. It's just a sort of uh, um, methodological example. Um, and we could try to you know, depict these side by side in a way that would um, let us see their, their different structure. Uh, so here are the two of them. Now, it turns out that the labels are consistent declared in each of them. So vertex one in each one is, is called hunger. Vertex two is called food eaten. We, you notice we could take their co-product. So I hope this is helping you recognize that um, these hatchets, although they incorporate this non-relational data, this attributed data, you can actually still perform these categorical operations. Another example of that is we could ask for the homomorphisms. Um, from uh, one, for example, uh, into another. In this case, uh, there are no such homomorphisms from CLD1 into CLD2 because the L minus goes uh, in the opposite direction. But scrolling down a little bit more, um, we could, we could, for example, define a, and I'm skipping around a little bit. Um, no, actually, it's just below that. Uh, we could define a vertex pair. This would be a pair of vertices. Um, and here I've labeled hunger and food eaten as the names of, of those, the two elements in the vertex. You notice there's no links between them. Um, they're just a pair of vertices, one called hunger, one food eaten. I could find the homomorphisms from that pair and to cause loop diagram 1A. I could find it from that pair and to cause loop diagram 1B. And then I could combine them with a push out. You remember the flavor of push out is to glue things together along points that are identified as being in common. So here, we're going to identify these two vertices as being in common. The first of the vertices, hunger, is going to be identified with the hunger vertices in causal loop diagram one and causal loop diagram two. So those will be glued. Those will be unified. Those will be fused. Food eaten will be identified with vertex two in causal loop diagram 1A and 1B. So those will be glued around those points also. Um, in other words, this sort of attributed data can be carried around, can be reasoned about with these homomorphisms. And, and we can further perform categorical operations with it. This categorical algebra that we've learned to, to value. Right. And so here we performed a, a push out on that, on this combined causal loop diagram. And I just went and I displayed it and what it lacks for beauty, it makes up for in power. Um, so now we have the two causal loop diagrams, which above, when we took a co product, were just laid side by side like tinker toy pieces have now been stuck together, you know, glued together at certain points and particularly around this vertex for the hunger 
and this one for the food eaten. And all these loops go from one to the other in a way that is suggested by what's labeled source and what's labeled minus, although it's very busy to say the least. It's very messy. So here what we've done is we've gone and taken a causal diagram um, in its simplest form. Um, and we previously had encoded it in a way that had interchangeable, but that really focused on the relationships involved. What was connected with what, with what directional layer, what directionality of, of links with what polarities. And we took that up a level. We incorporated labels. And by virtue of doing that, by incorporating labels, we have now um, been able to carry around the labels for things. We've been able to still perform categorical operations, still perform things like pushouts or co-products here. At the same time, um, having this ability to represent this this attributed data. Pardon me, I'm just going to turn off this slide a little bit here. Um, okay. Um, so this should start to get you thinking about, okay, this, this data can be woven in in ways that um, are at least consistent with our broader enterprise of leveraging the power of category theory for representing systems. Now I'd like to proceed to the other the other file here. Okay. And and this is this nine underbar ancient like uh attributed schema homomorphisms v3. And once again, we're going to start by executing the 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 imports associated with these packages up front. Now it may take you a bit of time if you're executing some of these for the first time for them to fully load in. Okay. Um so um here we're going to be focused on this agent like schema we saw before. And this is partly motivated by the vignette I gave indeed at the beginning of class, okay? Um, uh, this this idea of veterans and dogs and veterans um, have, have certain types of information like HPA1C measurements that are attributed data rather than relational data. Um, it's not just a matter of any old isomorphism where we shuffle things is fine as long as it preserves the relation. No, where, where we actually care about certain values, like about high HbA1c values. So here, let's let's go and explore this um, this notebook. Okay, so we're going to have an attribute declared where it has dogs and persons as objects, caregivers, so, so each dog has a person uh, as their caregiver. Now, persons are going to have three additional types of attributed information, each associated with its corresponding type. An age associated with an age attribute type. So there's going to be a map from person to their age attribute. So for a given person, it's going to pick out an element of the age attribute type. Um, they're going to, there's going to be a province type, recognizing provinces are not interchangeable, right? Um, uh, Quebec is not exactly the same as Ontario um, uh, or Alberta, for that matter. Um, uh, there's a province attribute in each person. So each person can have a province reflecting this. We're going to keep track of specific province names, not just view them as interchangeable numbers. And an HBA1C attribute. This is a measure of 
uh, glycated hemoglobin. It basically is used to measure to to assess someone at over a long period of time for the level of control they have over the blood sugar um, within their system, level of control their body's exerting over blood sugar. Um, okay, so those each have the attribute types. And the schema looks like this. Um, so again, dogs have persons associated with them, but persons have provinces, um, their scores and their age. And, and an H associated with it. Okay, now we're going to define an attribute type uh, for this. And for this, we're going to introduce a little bit more Julia machinery. So this is going to be our attribute type here. Um, but we're going to define a set of provinces, Canadian provinces, and some age groups of interest. Um, sometimes we're interested in capturing the fact that Quantities like age groups have a certain ordering to them. And we don't want it to just, you know, consider age group three is this or age group one is that it doesn't really matter as long as it's the relationship is maintained with people. No, we we care about ages 65 and up for certain regions um, or ages 0 to 17. Um, and then we're going to have an instantiation as before of this kind of generic schema, which, which doesn't yet have, excuse me, this generic uh, schema at it, map over, um, which doesn't have any particular types assumed for these attributes. We're going to make use of these as our age groups, these as our provinces, and for, for our uh, HbA1c, we're going to use a 32-bit floating point value. Um, in another language, you might use a double, for example. So we're going to execute that. And so now we have this ability to, to create populations and people with this atchet type, okay, with with these particular attribute types. Okay, now um, let's let's do some things with this, and we're going to learn some more about attributes and some ways that are fairly eye-opening, um, and in some cases different from how we would have done things if we had just C sets. Just these co co chiefs. But other times it's going to be quite exciting to see about the the um the, the strengths that they have, the extra power that they have, the affordances. So the first thing is we're gonna create a single person. And you may remember there's a way to do this by asking for the representable for the person. We'll be coming back to that concept. That's also one which I want to capture in this course, but we're going to build up a bit of theoretical debt before we get to that. It's a beautiful story, like with profunctors. In fact, it has some relationship with profunctors, particularly with the Hom profunctor. But for now, we're going to defer that a bit in the interests of getting into working with stock flow.jl. This is going to take a little bit of time to calculate the representables, but it's kind of the minimal unit we need to specify a single person. Okay. And a single person needs, needs some information to be specified, just like a dog would need a person to be specified as well as anything a person needs. A person is going to need to have some sort of stand with respect to their their attributes. Okay, here's our single person. It just came back. And now we see something quite interesting. For this single person, you know, person one, okay. But their age is not given. It can't, out of whole cloth, create some assumed age. 
to be the representable one, to be the quintessential person or the representative person. No, um, we have an attribute variable for age. We have an attribute variable for province. We have an attribute variable for the A1C score. And this is why these three, these three att attribute types have one associated with it. We don't need to create a dog because for a person, they don't have to have uh, a dog. If, if we had specified representable for dog, we would have needed not only a dog, but uh, a person as well, because each dog in this context needs needs a person as well as their um their characteristics um uh okay um maybe yeah maybe i'll i'll leave that for now we'll we'll come back to that uh at a later lecture so so we have this single person now hmm? by the way speak up if anyone wants to ask a question okay So we have a single person. We could take a co-product of themselves, of a single person with themselves, and we'll get two people, right? A person one has attribute variable one for age. They have some age. Person two is, in general, a different age. Person one has a certain province, not yet specified. Person two has a certain province, not yet specified. Same thing for their HbA1c score. Nothing requiring these to be the same between them. Let's create a sample population if we could. So here we have, we're going to have dogs. We're going to have persons. Persons are going to have certain ages. They're going to have certain provinces in which they live. They're going to have, the dogs are going to have certain caregivers. And here the persons are going to have certain HbA1c scores. Okay. And I'm going to execute that. And here's our database. Now, like with that case of causal loop diagrams, attributed causal loop diagrams, you'll notice that the database looks a bit different now. Where before, under age, you may 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 not remember, but there was like one, three, two, one, four, or no, not four, two, two, one, or whatever. It was it was always a foreign key into the age table. Now, the age group is a attribute, and so. Its value goes directly in this column. The province is an attribute. So its value goes directly in this column. The HbA1c is an attribute. So its value goes in there. It's not like there's one HbA1c value table, which lists all possible HbA1cs, and this is just a, a key into it. No, 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 no. It's, it's actually placed directly in here, right? Um, so I hope you're getting some flavor of how attributes differ here. This is kind of the intrinsic information that has some, it's externally defined, it has some meaning associated with it, where a value of 5.4 is very different in its implications from 9.1, right? And where sometimes it matters if someone's in Saskatchewan or Newfoundland, Labrador. Um, okay, now we still retain our ability Again, to, to reason categorically about things, right? To to reason in this in this rich categorical way about relationships. We can find relationships, for example, from a person using that as a pattern, recognizing they have these variables for the single person, representing you know, the fact that a representable person doesn't have a fixed value of HBA1C or fixed value of the province. And we can find homomorphisms from them into the single population, sample population. And it will look for these homomorphisms and we'll find, well, surprise, surprise, there's 20 different matches from a single person, ways a single person could match this population, right? Um, it could match person, one, it could match person two in the population. It can match person three. And as you'd expect, for each of them, 
there's going to be a um, a specific value of the age group that's associated with it, uh, or a specific value associated with the province uh, that that results when it matches Nova Scotia versus Newfoundland Labrador, for example. So, so you remember from before this notion that like a single person, it could represent a sort of pattern and homomorphism finding kind of finds that pattern in the target. You may actually remember that from some discussion of functors, that that's kind of the flavors functors have. Um, um, th they can sort of find a diagram in, you know, each functor finds a diagram in the target category, um, or some, some sort of structure preserving mapping of that diagram. Here we're finding this sort of representative person in the sample population, in this case, binding these variables, right? Um, okay, so, so that's kind of nifty. Now let's do something a, a little bit more interesting yet. Let's create a single elder, if, if we could. Um, now, we're going to do this in two different ways, because there's kind of a a uh, kind of fam more familiar way uh, that is very similar to what we've been using previously. Um, and then there's going to be a newer fangled way, uh, a way that's extra slick. So let's try the the tried and true, the 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 way we've been using. So here we define an AC set for this for this C set instance, uh, this one here, this guy here, which knows all about its about its attribute type. There we go. Um, uh, we're not going to require finding any dogs. Um, one person. Um, there, th there's no variables associated with their age. There's one variable says so their province and their HbA1c score. So we're going to have variables for that. For their age, we know they're an elder. So we're going to have their age be age 65 or up. And um, the caregiver, I don't know why this is one. I think it should be, I think it should be um, zero. I think it can be empty. Uh, Shayan, you could tell me, but I think because dog is zero, I think it doesn't, we don't actually need one. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's right. Okay, so here's our single elder. They're age 65 and up. They they um they've a very they've no particular province. They could be from any province, they could have any HBA1C score. Oops. Now, if we search for that pattern. In the population, we'll find seven such elders. Looks like person two, person four, person seven, person 10, person 11. Let's go up and check it out. Person two, person four, seven, 10, 11. Okay. Um, so we're indeed finding these elders in the population. We're doing so by setting up kind of a representative elder, you know, someone who, who looks like an elder, including these variables. And, and we are then saying, go find this. And the variables are a key component of this. We didn't use variables before, right? When we, when we had C sets, we would have just said, um, that they have any old, you know, one uh, 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 province of size one, a set, you know, province set uh, associated with them of size one. Um, uh, but there, if you think about it for the age, would have said, well, they have a particular age, one, but we didn't have a way of saying like, through this directly, we did through initial, but not through this. We didn't have a way of saying like, 
defined them as having a particular age. There was this thing with initial we did, but it kind of didn't didn't really jibe with the fact that really previously with C sets, as long as you know things can be rearranged, the ordering was kind of immaterial. You know, the ordering of the person table, the ordering of the dog table, the order of the province table, the ordering of the age table, you know, really uh, we shouldn't be hinging ourselves on. That. So we could once again take a co-product of elder and elder. Now let's look for a single Nova Scotian. Here we go. Same basic idea, right? We have one person. Now we have one age variable. We have one HbA1c variable still, but province, we have no province variables and we don't need a, a caregiver one because we have zero dogs. Okay. And we could look for the Nova Scotians here and let's go see what's going on with the Nova Scotians. Okay. Um, looks like there's two Nova Scotians. Come on. Um, persons two and 15. Let's, let's check it out. Here's our table. Two. Yep. I don't see any Nova Scotians here in 15. Okay. 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 There we go. Okay. Um, Okay, now I want to introduce you to the slick one. So that that's kind of the tried and true. Uh, I hope this is fairly familiar to people. Any questions on that before I move to the slick way? Are there any questions about phrasing things this way? It's very similar to what we did before, except now we have this thing attribute variables as part. How are people feeling? Are you feeling comfortable uh, with that? Yes, Good. and uh, um, does it need to define the uh, type of this attribute? For example, is integer or symbol or something else? Um, yeah, so I mean, we can choose what types we wish to impose here. I elected to choose enum types uh, for these two because I wanted to be sure the actual value was drawn from this set of possible values. I wanted to be sure the age was drawn from this set of possible values. Um, you'll often find examples where they use symbol and that would have somewhat of a similar flavor, except they wouldn't enforce that it has to be one of those. So someone could come up with some weird symbol, you know, like ABQC, which would be you know, nonsensical. Um, uh, they could put in any symbol they want. Here with any num, you're basically forcing it to be one of these. But meanwhile, I chose their HbA1c level, their level, their score on this medical test. Knowing that it was a floating point number, I chose it to be a floating point. Um, and in general, you want to choose types that are thoughtful given the type of quantity you want to try to capture. And in that sense, it's not that different from programming with the types. You want to use types that capture all of the values you want to be dealing with, but but capture their natural constraints. Like they can only be drawn from, from certain values so they have a certain ordering on them or what have you. So I don't I don't know if that's helpful, but Yes, that's what I thank you so much. Sure. Okay, now I want to show you a, a slick way for doing this, okay? Um, so um, uh, the slick way involves, um, oh, okay. Yeah, so I haven't set it up yet. Okay, what, um, where, where's my, where's my Yoneda? Oh no, did, did I accidentally delete my Yoneda? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Okay, where's where's Yoneda? Um, okay, so somewhere here it is. Okay, it looks like okay line forty two. We have to execute line forty two. Okay, somehow I I just skipped that. I'm 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 sorry. Right after that Nova Scotia thing, 
we should be calling Yoneda cash, okay? Um, this Yoneda cash. So it's, as I said, I think it's line 40, uh, whatever it is. It's it's just after the we find the Nova Scotians, I think. Uh, no. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. 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 Now, now I'm in trouble. Now I'm in trouble. I think, I think it is too low. Um, where is, where is this? Uh, so we had a single, Nova, oh, I see. Yeah. So really this should be moved down because we haven't done, or the Oneda cash should be moved up. Um, sorry about that. Um, I will move this up. So um, here we are. Um, just before this, we'll put this. Okay. Um, it's further down below if you want to find it. But basically, it's this value equals Yoneda under bar cash. And then it's the name of the schema that we've been dealing with uh, here. Um, and semicolon clear equals true. Okay. So this Yoneda cache um, performs the requisite calculations to allow us to efficiently use these AC set columns. And there's a great story here. Um, and the story has a lot to do with representables and figuring out representables because representables are the building blocks of functors. Uh, and when you do this UNADA cache, I think it's figuring out all the representables, which then allows it to quickly perform these AC set colons. But what we're going to see is this ACC, uh, ACET action colon is going to provide us with a quite slick way of defining conditions um, such as we might need when defining patterns, okay? So you'll notice that above, I manually define using that tried and true method, a single Nova Scotian here. And, you know, this this was um, hopefully pretty straightforward given your level of understanding. We knew dog had to be zero because we don't need a dog person. There just to be one person. We knew there needs, we're looking for a Nova Scotian. So there's no provincial attributes, but there are age attributes and HbA1c attribute variables needed rather, sorry, variables here needed, um, no variables for province and caregiver doesn't have to be specified because there's no dogs uh, whose caregivers are, are under concern. All of that is handled via the Stindle Nova Scotian uh, with HC set cola. Here we just say, hey, I want a person whose province is Nova Scotia. Note the dollar sign. Kevin Carlson was very, very helpful last night to clue us into um, to the need for this dollar sign. So here I want a person whose province is Nova Scotia. Okay. And it figures out all the requisite things needed to make that happen. And you can see this person that results is. In fact, the same as that person above who resulted. Um, it's just, it knows how to build that up. But we could do something more interesting than that. We could say, for example, maybe a single elderly um, Nova Scotian, we could define it manually um, and we could find such a person. Um, uh, we could also do so, well, okay, do I, um, well, maybe I'll ask you, um, if you want to try your hand at this. So based on this single Nova Scotian one, I'm going to ask you, what do you think I should type if I, if I want a si single elderly Nova Scotian through AC set colon, what am I going to put here? What do I have to put still? So it's a person. 
Their province is what? What's their province? Age. For the elderly people. So we need their age. In the province yeah. stays Nova Scotia. So we have to do age, right? Age. Is it is it uh is it called age? Uh age, yes. And the age it, of the person is and we need to do uh Nova Scotia. Okay. Um oops, okay. Um oh sorry. Ah, not Nova Scotia. What am I saying? <laughs> age. Ages, what did I say? Ages 65 and up or age 65, 65 up? Age 65 and up, I think maybe is what I, I said. Um, because I know my habits. Um okay. Um there we go. So now this is a uh a, a, a single elderly Nova Scotian, and we can find through homomorphism some I have an eye towards the time here homomorphisms, we could find a map from them into the sample population. And here we are. We find person two in the sample population, it says is, is an elderly Nova Scotian. And so, so indeed they are, person two. Um, and just by you know, inspection, the others from Nova Scotia are, are, you know, I, I only see two from Nova Scotia here, and, and that, that one's the only one that's elderly. Okay. Um, okay, so we have this uh, AC set colon, um, but let's, let's use this in a little bit of a more uh flexible uh flexible way here um i'm going to now look for okay so just going up and down it's not the strong suit of this of, of jupiter um okay what i wanted to do is go down to a point where we okay um so we had a single elder. Aha. Uh -huh. It's pair of same age, line 44. Sorry to jump around. It's just time is, is limited here. So pair of same age uses the same principle, except we have two people. And the age of the first equals the age of the second. Okay. So here we go. Now, you'll see something very interesting here. Because as before, this is an achet. So we have a, a little table. We have persons one and two. Those are the rows. And we have three columns. One for each of what in this case are, are achets. Uh, excuse me. What in this case are attributes. For age, we have a variable. For province, we have a variable. For HbA1c scores, a variable. But the interesting thing here is that age is unlike these other two in a certain regard. What In what regard is the, the values in the age column different from what we see in these others? Anyone? The age are the same. Yeah. Uh, so for, uh, those, uh, person there's one, one shared variable between them. So their ages, what age it is remains to be seen, but it has to be the same between person one and person two. Meanwhile, we don't know what their provinces are going to be, but in general, it's different between the two. And their HB and 1C scores, we don't know what they are either, but they're different between the two. But age has common variable uh, between the two. So we can now ask for homomorphisms, for example, uh, of people of the same age. And we can we can find uh, people of that uh, of that age. So some of these are not going to be so instructive. For example, person one uh, with person one. Uh, so we might want to 
restrict it so that each person is distinct. So here we're going to have homomorphisms from that pair constructed by AC set colon um, to the sample population, but where we don't have a clash, we don't have the two persons mapping to the same thing in the target population. So here we're going to be looking for matches that where we have distinct people, uh, where person one is not the same as person two. So we have person one and person eight, it's saying, are of the same age. So we can go back and look. Person one, Newfoundland Labrador, is zero to 17, and person eight is zero to 17 from Quebec. Okay. Um, so that's uh, encouraged, uh, encouraging. We could also look for people from the same province, right? Um, now we share a single variable about that, about their province. And we could again ask for distinct people, um, distinct pairs ordered, um, which are from the same province. So this is saying person two and person 15 are the same. Person two is from province Nova Scotia and person 15 is from Nova Scotia as well, indeed. Um, uh, one is a young and, and one is a senior, but uh, they share they share their Nova Scotia heritage, okay? Um, uh, as do I, I might add. Um, so uh, here we have, uh, here we have this ability to inquire about individuals who are sharing similar characteristics. Okay, now, now I'm all uh, confused because we're uh, the numbering seems to be different. Okay, um, uh, so the final thing is you're going to tell me how to prepare a pattern to find people, pairs of distinct people in the same age who are in the same province. So what's a good way to start? You tell me. Oh, well, okay. I guess I have the answer there. I don't want to look at that. Okay, you tell me, where do I start? What do, what do I do? Hmm? Well, maybe I can start from this, right? Let's 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 do that. Let's here we go. Um student answer. Okay. Pair from same province and same age. Okay, so this is a good starting point. What else do I need? Eh? Age uh P1 equal to age P two. Age P P one equals age P two. Okay, good. Good. And if I do this, then I will see that for age, they share the, the same variable. For province, they share a same variable for, for province, but they have different HbA1c scores. And I could ask about homomorphisms from this into sample population and and what we would see is 28 cases except what's the problem you tell me what's the problem here clearly what's what's not very helpful about this this is one answer of the persons. This is another. This is another. What's the problem? Hmm? Same person. Same person. So we want to do Monic equals, and Cheyenne is going to have to help us here, but I think it, Cheyenne, is this right? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, I think it's right. Okay. Okay. Now we. Now we're going to find the monic cases, cases where those where different ordered pairs. Um, okay, so person it says 
person three and five, for example, should have, yeah, uh, um, uh, sorry, sorry, I am scrolling up and down. Okay, uh, here we go. Person three and five should be from the same province and same age. Let's go up and look. Three and five and three and five. Oh, lo and behold, Saskatchewanians uh, unite. Three and five, same age, same province. Right? Okay. So what we've just seen is a transition from a world where we are dealing in mathematically powerful, insightful, general, general, expressive ways about relational data to a world where through this extension to attributed C sets, where we can keep track of a much larger set of other types of data data defined by other data types within within our our world for example even rather articulated structures like expression trees for gatlab uh expressions we can use these as attributes um associated with our our data and yet we can still capture the relational structure in this rich, general, reproducible, powerful, expressive way. And we can reason about it categorically, reason about its broader implication, analyze it, transform it, engage in data migration with it, yet carry around all these additional types of data as well in the process. And we've seen that these basic principles we've learned to perform, uh, for example, reasoning about these, these quantities uh, in terms of their relationship with universal constructions, performing categorical algebra, taking homomorphisms, um, a homomorphism from one uh, functor to another, and reason about the, the structure of the schema category where it comes to its morphisms, they hold, they, though they're adapted in some of the particulars, um, like going from a presentation of a category to presentation of a pro functor. We, we secure this enormous mathematical richness now for a much larger set of types of data the types of data that in a data science context we're dealing with um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, data associated with attributes. But the prospects here are profound um, because all too often in data science, all too often in statistics, all too often in the context of 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 uh dynamic modeling actually um it's easy to focus in although less so there i'd say uh it's easy to focus in on data and isolations without remembering those relationships that are present and the ability to undertake work with attributed data alongside in concert with jointly with relational data and to, and to use a categorical lens for them lets us reason about a much broader set of things with facility and with uh, guaranteed structure and all too, all too often this is lost when we're dealing just with attributed data we have data of time series without any relationship of one data point to the other expressed. Or we have data from a 
from a certain region without capturing the geographical structure of the region. All too often within data science, we have this fragmentation and we're treating data as solitudes. And what this beckons to us, this, this, this categorical work with attributed C-sets is a fresher vision, a deeper vision, a vision that could at once be true to this idea of capturing morphisms, capturing relationships that interlink different components, that interlink these different structures. Um, while not denying their difference relates them to one another, um, while still allowing us to analyze uh, rich sets of data that that are not relational alongside them and 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 in concert with them. And that that suggests to us great, great power. And Xiao Yan in in helping us to understand stockflow.jl and indeed later in algebraic ABMs, you know, we're going to be talking about components which link together different sets of data, structures like structured co-spans, for example. We're going to be returning to, to push-outs uh, when it comes to, to sort of um, unifying, um, identifying different diagrams around a common point. We're referring to pullbacks in the context of, of dealing with um, stratification. In ways that doesn't deny um, uh, the the attributed type of data, but lets us perform these higher level categorical operations um, that take advantage of the relational structure together with that. And it is to that enterprise that we will now turn, starting with Thursday's lecture. So I want to thank you for uh, bearing with the remote nature of this um, um, of this you know class. Um, I very much hope to be better by Thursday, and to be able to to um, return to the classroom with you. Um, but I hope it's offered some modicum of value, um, uh, despite the, the the limitations of remote presentation. And I look forward to joining you for Thursday for uh, as we uh, as we turn to the matter of stockflow.jl, led by its creator uh, and champion uh, Chao Yan. So thank you very very much. And I think uh, with those words, I'll stop the recording.